Jason, uh, thanks for sitting down with us today and welcoming us into your home for this discussion. My pleasure to have you here, Graham. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Austin, Texas. Um, listen, you, you've published widely on trends and, and, and future outlooks. I mean, you were telling me that you published a paper with the Pentagon as the supply chain issues started to bite. How did you get here? What led you to uh, this trends and future work? It's kind of a long, windy road, as one might expect. Uh, it's not a teleological journey by any sense of the word. I, I studied history as an undergrad. I became an economist, later first professionally, worked as a consultant, was forecasting financial markets. And then my clients a number of years ago came to me and said, we really appreciate that you can model econometrically what's going to happen with financial markets and, and currencies, commodities and things. We need to know about what what tail end events in a longer term could happen. And at that point, I really needed to develop a toolkit for planning and, and forecasting in unstructured environments. I founded the Futurist Institute, created an entire course of training, research, published books on this, because as I went through the process, I then created what I wished I had had at the beginning. And that's really um, helped me kind of build that out. And uh, it's very exciting work and it, it, it incorporates um, many different things from my previous careers. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a fascinating area of work. And I think, you know, when you talk about unstructured markets and disrupt, disruptions, I mean, boy, <laughs> we couldn't be in a more disrupted environment than we are right now. And yesterday you presented at the South By talking about 10 trends around uh, transport and logistics. Um, it was a fascinating talk, by the way. Um, and, and, and of course, one of the, the key themes of this week at the South By has been, has been technology. And uh, I sat in a session with Mark Zuckerberg, the metaverse, and uh, you know this was all pretty interesting. But um, what role is technology going to play in transport and logistics? This is a very material-based, asset-based industry. How do you see technology shaping supply chains and, and the transport logistics? Yeah, so this is a great question. I remember yesterday in the talk at South by, and I appreciate y'all, but we're there for that. I did say, look, this is not the metaverse, right? Because we talk about technology, we think about the digital world, but at the end of the day, we all want real stuff. We all want physical things. And we saw that surge in goods demand and tight supply chains in the wake of COVID and, and even now. And I think about how does the virtual world, how does technology play out? You know, we see things like um, training for people in different jobs. You can use VR to make sure people know their jobs before they're actually physically on the spot. Um, that, that's one area where you can see how does that metaverse play out. And we, we think of it as for a gaming and an, and an exciting entertainment world. But you know, there are these kind of relatively boring corporate use cases that have high value for all new technologies, right? We think about blockchain and people are super excited about crypto. Well, you know what it's really good for? It's really good for keeping track of where your goods are. And NFTs, wow, you know, it's, you know, apes and, and, and people and the whole thing. And you're, well, yeah, and you can also use it for supply chain provenance. And so sometimes these things that become fads in technology, there's another use case that most people aren't thinking about that probably has real economic impact. Now, there are other areas where there's more clearly defined, clearly obvious areas of impact. We think about artificial intelligence. I think about the future of quantum computing and how that's going to help optimize supply chains, where there's increased stressors, increased demands, increased needs. I think about automation. And while people are like, look at that disco dancing robot, right, which is cool, and robots doing parkour and dog dancing robots on, on late night TV are super cute and whatnot. The truth is, is that there's already a ton of automation in supply chain, material handling, warehousing. Without that, we wouldn't be able to have e-commerce the way we do. And so we're going to see a lot of these automation technologies, data technologies, but even the virtual reality, even the, the biggest of sort of the hype locust dynamics around NFTs and blockchain, all of that's going to come to a supply chain near you. Yeah. No, it's an exciting, exciting future for sure. But one of the things that, um, you know, if you're running a supply chain, you need is certainly visibility and certainly optimization, but you still need to move stuff. At the end of the day, it's physical. So is this then more about 
sort of merging the physical with the with the with the meta, uh, as you might say? Or how, how do you see that? Because at the end of the day, you still have to move stuff. I mean, I see it as sort of a, a bifurcated situation, right? There's the metaverse, and there are uses for the metaverse, like for training, right? Uh, th there are different things that can be done. We think about self-driving cars. Rather than having them on roads, you can kind of bootstrap the number of miles if you create a virtual world where the technology because look, the, the, the operating system of a self-driving car doesn't know it's on an actual road. It doesn't care if it's on an actual road or, or, or operating in a digital world, right? So there's ways you can bootstrap uh, the, that kind of automated technology. But in terms of moving stuff around, uh, I think provenance is important. I think about energy efficiency, something that came up in our talk around sustainability and climate change because even if we move to a world of, let's say, regionalized or localized 3D printing operation facilities, which become like the modern blacksmith, whatever you need, you go there and they make it for you. Well, that's really great, but they're probably not making it out of thin air, which means you still need aluminum and copper and plastics and resins and all these other things to be there. Well, that stuff still needs to show up. You still need to move those things. Making sure people know that there's a physical supply chain where things are physically moving, um, I, I think that's really important. That's, that's not the metaverse, but if they want the VR headsets, they want the computers, they want the chips, and they want the couch they're sitting on and the food they're snacking on, you know, we don't have replicators. This is not Star Trek. So supply chains are, are going to be really critical. Even if we had a fully 3D printing world, you're still gonna need a lot of stuff moving around. Yeah. One of the things that struck me coming into this industry um, is uh, how uh, antiquated it was uh, 14 years ago in terms of how communications are done, how uh, the clearance system works. And when you talk about quantum computing optimization, I mean, part of the challenge, of course, has been many actors, many moving parts. You just simply don't have the computing capabilities to make this optimized. So can you speak a bit more about where quantum could take us in terms of being able to optimize complex networks and, and, and keep those dynamics in check. Sure, sure. And, and I think it's really interesting you say uh, that 14 years ago it was antiquated because I think about doing MBA courses almost 20 years ago and supply chain were words that were barely uttered. And e even in more recent years, supply chain isn't something people talked about. But once COVID hit, every granny and little child was talking to you about their supply chain problems, right? And, and everyone now has this you know, the fact that supply chain has become a, a zeitgeisty idea and that there's this broader awareness of it is uh, very, very interesting to me uh, as someone who's been involved in supply chain industries for many, many years. And I think the technology and the applicability to generate ROI and improve efficiency and optimization, all of those things are really exciting to me. And for quantum computing, you're talking about probabilistic, non-deterministic calculations that will be done as quantum computing reaches scale. So in other words, a uh, non-probabilistic, uh, deterministic calculation would be, think of an Excel spreadsheet, three plus three, right? It gets you six. That's very deterministic, it's not probabilistic. Now, if we have a, a massive amount of data around a certain number of goods that need to go to a certain number of places and we plug them in to a quantum computer, in theory, what happens is, and we know this, we know this happens, but at scale, we would, in theory, over time, be able to apply this to supply chain, where the least optimized solutions of ways to deliver all those different goods, transfer all those goods, would be eliminated, and what you'd be left with is the non-deterministic, probabilistic best answer. Now, is that the right answer? Well, no, but you're dealing with such a really wild set of data and so much data, it would be a very different way to computationally get there. Yeah, I remember doing operational research and linear programming at university and it's just taking it to that third dimension, which is the which is the, the goal that we'd always been seeking, right? I mean, it just that's opens right. up so many possibilities. I think that that's really exciting, I think. That's right. Both from an efficiency perspective, and then you think also from miles traveled and the sort of environmental perspective, sort of huge, huge potentials there. To just switching a bit, I mean, technology is also, apart from impacting the supply chain, how we run things, is impacting the customer, the consumer, how they have interacted with the buying experience, e-commerce being, of course, 
um, the, the the main uh, go-to tool during the pandemic. Um, how how what what's going on on the consumer side in terms of the use of tech? Where do you see this going, and how do you see it impacting on supply chains, particularly last mile and so on, where demand has increased uh, significantly? Let's say. Yeah. So consumers um, are not very tolerant of things not working right. They have very high expectations. So if you if you expect something will be delivered on a certain day, it, it needs to be there. We, we know that now. Apply that to future technologies. So the first time flying drones deliver me something here in Austin, Texas, I'm gonna be like, wow, here comes my flying drone. That's so cool. The second time I'm gonna be like, why is it 30 seconds late? So, you know, th this is how consumers are going to approach this. They get used to a technology, they get accustomed to it. Like if you took e-commerce away today, you know, <laughs> might be you know people might lose their minds right like it would be something that, that that people are very very unhappy about they're you know hooked on the sauce and they'll get hooked on whatever technology makes their lives more convenient and so for last mile this is really where you know satisfying that and fulfilling that promise of e-commerce we can get you stuff it will get it cheaply we'll get it fast it'll be there pretty much as soon as you need it it's gonna be on time you know all of those promises are fulfilled because there's so much technology on the back end. As the amount of e-commerce continues to rise, and as we see in markets where e-commerce is not um, broadly used, it will be adopted. We're going to see more and more stressors on the system. And thinking about that efficiency, optimization, all of that in terms of operational limitations, but also thinking about the operational um, efficiency in terms of fuel consumption are going to be really important to try to not only meet the needs of we want to keep our customers happy and yet they have even more demands and they want even more stuff and yet we need to do it with a smaller CO2 footprint. So all of those things become moving pieces that really require an integrated understanding of the technologies available and what the design thinking uh, parameters are. What does the customer want and what do they expect yeah. yeah the question around returns is a really good one and i think a lot of businesses have probably built very successful models based on the fact that people want to return things but never get around to it uh, we've seen similar things historically around rebates right oh buy this there's a huge rebate and more than 50 percent never redeem it right so there's a lot of science around this that sometimes people don't want something but they just can't be bothered to return it in terms of when you do want to return things, there are often many ways to do this, right? You can bring it to a store, you can put it in the mail, you can put it with one of the other parcel shippers, people can pick it up at your house, different companies offer different things, and since they're delivering stuff all the time everywhere anyway, um, if they're already on the road, whether they're dropping something off at your house or picking it up, as long as that's integrated into their sort of daily uh, plan and whatever the, the last mile transport is, it's less critical an issue, I think. It would only be a really critical issue if you had a market where you didn't have a high density population, you didn't have a lot of e-commerce, and you had a disproportionately high number of returns. So I think that those three things seem very difficult to get to, especially since post offices exist, right, in every little village and town everywhere. Most returns can happen that way. If you don't bring it to the post office in time, the company's all the happier. So um, I, I guess that's that's how I approach that question. Yeah. Um, so I mean, from discussing this from the tech side, right, from the sort of complexities of managing supply chain down to now, you know, the the last mile and the demands of the of the customer. Supply chain is becoming more intricate. They're becoming more. There's more dependencies in the system. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, we're seeing a lot more disruption coming yeah. from big events around the world, but also micro events. And so this has led to this theme of resilience in supply chains. Um, how does that look? Sort of you look sort of 5, 10, 15 years out or even in the immediate situation we're in with um, issues in China and, of course, in Europe. How, how should companies be thinking then about being able to run these supply chains, given all of the dependencies and given the increasing number of disruptions they're seeing in the marketplace? 
It's a very difficult question and there are a few answers. Unfortunately, none of those answers are cheap and many of them at cost. We think about the importance of not having a sole source vendor for a product, right? Making sure that you have multiple potential vendors and maybe one is the cheapest and one is the best, but if you source everything from that one vendor and everyone sources everything from that one vendor, if something goes wrong, suddenly your supply chain breaks, you no longer have a business. I think about redundancies, not just there, but also within the supply chain. If you have localized issues, you, this is the reason maybe you want to have more than just enough trucks to transport and just enough vans and just enough freight, which brings me to the bigger overarching theme, which is for decades, the trend in supply chain has been to just in time. Everything should be just in time. You need just enough to get by and everything will be fine. And maybe that worked fine up until COVID, but as we see disruptions and other risks becoming more fractal, there have been other different disruptions we've seen in recent years. But I think this is one where we've seen many companies suddenly approaching the challenge, going um, maybe away from just in time and moving to just in case. Does that reduce your profit margin? Yes. Does that increase your OPEX? Yes. Does having extra inventory, extra trucks, extra vendors that don't add value and add cost, is that good for your bottom line? Not directly, but it's a kind of insurance. And as we all know, when you, know, when you buy insurance, that's not something that adds to your bottom line, right? That's an expense but you certainly want to have it when things go wrong. And so having those redundancies, having that just in case, that's something that people have been pushing for uh, in, in the last year and a half, especially in supply chains. There was a big uh, you know, contention between just in time and just in case. And I think in 2022, the folks who were pushing for just in case in 2021 seem somewhat vindicated right now. But as you say, it's a, it's a costly exercise. And I mean, if you look at some of the numbers on, you know, uh, cost of warehousing, when you take into account you know, insurance costs and so on and so forth, redundancies and, and so on. I mean, you're looking at for, for some products up to 50 percent of cost of goods sold. So it's a, it's, 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 there's a balancing act here. And there's, I think there's going to be a continuum. But as you said, if you don't have the product, you miss the sale. And, right. and in this day of, uh, of, of e-commerce, then you lose a customer. Uh, right. Potentially, so so I think that that calculus seems to be seems to be changing uh, for, for for sure. Um, so there's very clearly you know some of the the disruptive events um, we've talked about during um, COVID where you simply couldn't get product. Yeah. Today we're facing other and ongoing issues. How what should what should um, companies be thinking about in terms of potential disruptions that are coming at them um, over the next sort of few years and then you know these, these some of these trends will continue out over the next five or ten what, what sort of top of mind for you that companies should be should be thinking about and planning about um, to make their supply chains resilient I think just in case is the way to go uh, every year the Futurist Institute produces something called the robot automation almanac mm -hmm. it's a collection of about two dozen different essays from executives in different fields about automation and AI and robotics we always have folks who contribute from supply chain Jim Rice from the MIT yeah. CTL program contributed to this year's almanac and there were other supply chain professionals executives who did as well and in those essays this year and in, in my essay as well there, there was a discussion around just in case. And at the end of the day, if you don't have the goods, you don't make the sale, you might lose the customer. Going forward, that imperative will not go away. And I think even about consumers, I think about toilet paper shortages that happened in 2020. And I can imagine easily someday um, my grandchildren or someone else's grandchildren coming up to me and asking me, why I have a large pantry? Why I have a closet full of toilet paper? And it's going to be, well, you know, I lived through the COVID, right? Now, does having that extra toilet paper, extra food, extra stuff around, it just, is that a good use of my funds? <laughs> If I don't want to run out of it, it is, right? And so this is, even consumers are making this decision. Even home builders are now putting pantries in homes. Something that even though, right, e-commerce stuff can get here quickly. Yeah, but the, but the e-commerce has to be in the warehouse in order for it to get to your house in the first place. So you're seeing these decisions being made even at the retail consumer level going all the way up. And in a, in a, in a call I had earlier today about some of risks that are continuing to go fractal uh, with a manufacturer or a series of manufacturers. My recommendation really was to remember, you don't own the goods until they're in your warehouse. And if you don't have them, you 
do not have them. No matter what your hedging strategy is for supply, no matter how secure you feel in it, you don't have it unless you actually do. Yeah. And that, that's an interesting point. So, I mean, given that supply chain is becoming sort of really core and become visibly core to the value proposition, what are you hearing and seeing from those who um, rely on those supply chains? Are they thinking, hey, we need to take control of this and bring it in-house, or is it more take the other extreme? No, we need professionals and we need to have a much more different set of products offerings from those logistics companies in order to make our supply chain resilient, in order to make them integrated and efficient. Now, what's the, what's the kind of sense you're getting from those that you talk to, or is it too early to, uh, to make that call? I, a lot of the companies I talk to have supply chain professionals, and many of the businesses, we do a lot of work with MHI, which is the material handling industry in the United States. That's a supply chain business, right? And, and those companies are, are struggling with these. Well, if you're in a supply chain industry and you're struggling with supply chain issues, what does that mean for everyone else, right? So, um, and that's, that's like the heart and core of it. So every industry is struggling with these issues, and many of them have had very little visibility of supply chain up until recently. What this means, I do think, is the easiest answer is buy it all, buy it now, let's stock up. And that, that's, is that an elegant answer? No. Could that exacerbate the bullwhip effect? Yes. Uh, is it a brute force answer that for people without, you know, d deep skill in the space is easy to implement? Yes. Just stock up our warehouse. And you know what? Worst case scenario, as long as we have non-perishable goods, we're going to have some inventory on our balance sheet for a while, but our customers will be happy. And we think about vendor scorecards, something that in procurement supply chain has been very important for evaluating, right? How reliable is your vendor? Oftentimes, you know, there are lowest cost vendors, but that's not who sometimes companies choose from a procurement strategy standpoint. You want the most reliable vendor and you're willing to pay a premium for reliability. Well, if you're willing to pay a premium, if people are going to pay you a premium, you know what? We can afford to have more inventory because people know we will always have it here. And we're going to see some of that. I think we're also going to see manufacturing change and regionalization, uh, localization, globalization of some of the manufacturing. I suspect we'll see, uh, if, uh, looking forward five, ten years from now, a lot more manufacturing in the United States. We'll probably see a lot more manufacturing in the European Union. You're going to see... Uh, and now a lot of that will probably be automated, but we're going to see a lot more manufacturing in those places to reduce this risk to shorten some of the supply chains. Right. right. <clears throat> so we've talked about tech and how that's impacting. The other sort of vector or dimension here is regulation, what policymakers are doing. And it goes also to your last point around nearshoring, and there seems to be an, uh, uh, an increased appetite to um, tilt the playing, playing field, or some would say level the playing field, to encourage some of that reshoring. One of the things you touched on yesterday was around providence of parts and, and a bit understanding where um, down into tier three uh, suppliers your yeah. parts are coming from. Can you speak to that a little bit about sure. you know, what, um, what regulators are looking for there, particularly in the current context of sanctions and so on, becomes yeah. even more pressing, I think. Um, but then maybe also more broadly about what you're hearing from policymakers around their attitudes to sort of global trade and, 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 and the level playing field. Sure. As we sit here uh, and the opening salvos of Cold War II have started, I suspect going forward, you will see trading blocks emerge and not, not too dissimilar from what we saw in the first Cold War. That being said, even for many years, if you wanted to do work with the U.S. Department of Defense, for example, there's a list of goods you cannot be using in that work. And going forward, I have been expecting, following especially the tariffs in the U.S., that were implemented under the Trump administration, the Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, and the Section 301 tariffs on, on, on various goods, especially high-tech goods, those were carried forward and have remained in place under the Biden administration, which means this is a bipartisan concern, right? The, the, those are two very different administrations, and they're both holding firm on this point. Uh, um, I think we will see more types of regulation around where things come from and an expansion of which governments require things to be from certain countries, or rather a list of uh, companies, uh, countries from which you cannot be using certain parts, certain components, that will go from what had been at the DOD and the federal level down to state governments, local governments, 
all of those requirements. We could see that also in Europe expand as well. So depending on what happens as Cold War II moves forward, we are likely to see these dynamics evolve further. And this makes provenance really important because if you're doing work with, if you're doing any work with a national state, local government, you might need to demonstrate that yes, indeed, those microchips, that hard drive, those laptops, uh, those video cameras did not come from country X, Y, or Z. How are you going to do that? This is where something like blockchain and NFTs could become very important. Um, a, a company that I, I founded uh, with um, with a JV partner uh, called um, our, 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 the co-founded entity is called NFT Degree, and the idea is to create NFTs that secure the provenance of academic degrees because it's something that you could easily replicate, right? If I took my college diplomas, I can bring them down and reprint a copy. But if I had an NFT that was issued by the university on my degree, you wouldn't be able to duplicate that and, and the app and confirm it. And so the idea would be with parts that you would be able to authenticate that this part came from this company, from this location That's right. with these inputs. That's right. So our JV partner is called iTrace and this is what they do. They, um, they create for physical parts, like aircraft parts, think high tech parts, think luxury goods. They put NFTs onto these goods and they are scanned in by their own proprietary app on their controlled blockchain and then as it moves through the system you now can see where it's been used and where it's from for something like aircraft parts this is especially important because they might have a useful life of say 20 years and you certainly want to know what planes was it on when was it serviced um, what airlines had it where was it made when was it made right all those things can be recorded on permanent corporate blockchains. Again, we're not talking about recording it to Ethereum. We're not talking about selling these like artwork. We're talking about creating a unique marker that is uh, controlled and created by a specific entity and monitored by their controlled blockchain so that you can verify its provenance. So that's very different, but it's exactly to your point. You want to be able to know where, when, how, the, the, the whole everything of it in a permanent and easily verifiable way. And so in the same way we're doing that with, with um, uh, intellectual capital assets, right? physical assets, that's going to become a, a conditio sine qua non going forward as we see these Cold War II risks continuing to evolve. And presumably, if we think also in terms of the um, greening of not just supply chains, but our general economy in terms of reuse and recycling of parts, this is also potentially a huge um, uh, enabler for being able to track and trace, know the, yep. the quality of the part, understand its history, yep. and then refurbish and recycle, presumably. Uh, absolutely. And uh, there could even be inputs around what the CO2 content is. So as we think about some com countries that are more focused on CO2 uh, and others that are not, if you're inputting goods from a country and it is some way marked so that you can confirm its provenance, you may want to levy a tariff on those goods, for example, that come from a place where CO2 is not a priority. And by doing so, that, that, that tax might incentivize either greener behaviors at home or provide the finances to, to, from the, the tariff revenue to increase competitiveness for goods and allow those funds to um, do any number of things, either subsidize more greening at home or uh, be as a rebate to consumers who might be paying more because there, there, there's an offset in place that's captured by that tariff. These are things that right now have been in discussion, are in the works. Whether they come to fruition or not in the United States, I don't know, but but this is something that's been out there as a discussion point to make things a more level playing field in terms of um, thinking about CO2 uh, and uh, uh, sustainability. Yeah. So it seems that, I mean, there's quite a few forces here, right, to, to where we started that these are not linear, this is not just about economics uh, in terms of driving uh, efficiency anymore. There are policy layers, there are technology layers. Yeah. And on the technology side, we've had these push and pull factors. And one of the sort of pull factors is, uh, in my head, is around automation and 3D printing, making it more possible on a sort of on a commercial basis to produce stuff closer to the consumer. So you think about you know, the reason supply chains went uh, to Southeast Asia principally was because of the labor cost arbitrage. You could produce things more cheaply. 
as you're beginning to increase automation, um, does that change the equation? And does 3D printing, does that begin to change the equation around the pure sort of economics and commerciality of where you produce stuff? Let me disaggregate the, the two kind of topics here. And so the first is, as we think about uh, the use of automation and then we think about the use of 3D printing, automation's coming everywhere, right? And if we think about China, um, you know, the, the world's factory floor, uh, there are a lot more robots there than there are in, in almost any other country. I, I think they have the most robots, right, in manufacturing out of anywhere in the world. And they're adding lots of robots. So to think that we would build factories that don't have robots, uh, you know, it, is, um, is probably not where we would go. We would build factories with robots. What does that do to the calculus of it all? I think there are other parts at play and not just automation. I think the tariff situation, I think trade relations, all of these things. For 3D printing, I think this is still rather relatively niche uses. Does it reach commercial scale? Does it replace factories? Do we replace entire parts? Over time, maybe. I feel like this is more a maybe someday situation rather than an almost now. And I tend to divide the future into two, two time frames: the almost now and the maybe someday. The automation is here, not just in the almost now, but in the now. And we think about factories and supply chains and um, automation is across all of those. We're beginning to see more retail robots now, but in the supply chain of manufacturing, they, they, are, they are very present. Um, in terms of 3D printing, I think that's still going to be a little ways out yeah. at scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also talked yesterday um, around, a bit around, you could say, the land side, and I'm really thinking now about the greening of, of logistics. Of course, a huge um, challenge and certainly something that Maersk is at the forefront of uh, leading on, on, on the ocean side. Um, the land side is important as well, of course. Um, that's also challenging. I mean, you talked yesterday about batteries and electric vehicles and some of the constraints there. What, what do you see? What's, uh, what, what are the, 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 the roadblocks to really scaling up on, on the electric vehicle side or alternative fuel side um, on, on, on the vehicle and, and sort of land side of the supply chain? Yeah, the, the biggest challenges to electric vehicles and batteries are the limitation of the materials that go into the batteries. Um, everyone wants a green planet. Everyone would love to see net zero CO2 emissions. Based on research we've done, based on data from the IMF, there's just, there's just not enough of the basic materials to get there. And we think about supply chain problems, you know, if you don't have enough lithium and cobalt, your, your supply chain isn't just across an ocean, right? You know, the only way you get new lithium and cobalt is dead stars. So if that's now your supply chain source for your battery materials, um, you have a serious problem. So more mining might, might help us find what's here, but if we don't have the materials on the planet, we're not going to be able to probably get to all the batteries everyone wants, at least not in that time frame. Now we're talking off-planet mining. This is all very complicated, very expensive. Um, this is a much further out sort of problem. But the big underscore thing is we all want electric vehicles, lots of electric batteries everywhere. Um, that's the expectation of the general public, especially in Europe. We're gonna have electric vehicles everywhere there just might not be enough of the batteries to do that, which means, I suspect, commercial vehicles become the main target for these batteries. Um, even if we think about waterborne transport, it's very difficult uh, in, in the current situation to imagine that um, because of limited ranges and, and how are you charging them and, and this sort of thing. But one of the main sources of some of the emissions around freight uh, is often tugboats that are assisting boats coming in and getting out of harbors. Well, those could go electric, those could be charged. So maybe within the supply chain, we have to think about flexibility wise, where can we get to commercial grade application of electric vehicles? Because using like me having an electric car, I don't have an electric car, it doesn't make a lot of sense. My car sits in the driveway in the garage, 97 plus percent of the time. And for most people it's 95% plus, right? There's no need, that, that's actually a waste of the battery in that sense. But having every delivery van, having every um, um, uh, heavy duty truck, having every tugboat have a, a, an electric battery, oh, that makes a lot of sense from a CO2 emission standpoint, from a utilization standpoint, 
that's where you have your impact. And I think that's what we will see. But for some forms of transport, um, it might require something else. It might take longer to get to um, the different technologies that will make everything what we want it to be. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. This this tiering of markets that we're going to see for some of these key key technologies. No, that that's something to certainly think about. And when you think about the, the cost and pricing, of course, there will be consequences of having to ration um, uh, the the technology essentially. Right. And if we, if we think about like on road trucks, you know, they're on the road almost all day. They're they're putting out a lot more CO two than when like you know I drive somewhere. I'm not driving many places. So we certainly would want those vehicles to have electric batteries right away. Right. And 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 buses and other forms of transport. They're transporting lots of people. So I, I think we're going to see not necessarily a, a mandated or regulated rationing, but just from an economic use case, the batteries get more expensive and then suddenly the market figures out, oh, who can really get the best ROI of electric? Oh yeah, it's a commercial vehicle that's on the road all the time. And this is one of those tricky areas where you need you need those market signals to do exactly that. At the same time, you need there's a role for government and public policy to catalyze and to think about the infrastructure side. So it's a really uh, careful balancing act that has to be struck in order not to kill off the market signals. Well, that's that's right. And of course, there's also the other piece, which is a lot of the electric battery tech that we've seen and the advancements of the last decade have been driven by retail demand. Yeah. So the interesting part is right the whiz bang of you know whatever we see on on TV or thinking electric, individual re, retail consumers thinking electric is cool, or even if it's virtue signaling, like I wanna just say I have an electric car, it doesn't matter, that's driving the tech. And so it's, it's really strange, right? Because the demand signal's coming from the retail consumers who are actually not the most efficient market from a CO2 standpoint, but that's what's driving the technology and the development. So, uh, you know, I think we're gonna see this, this balancing act going forward, but if, if CO2 really becomes a probability, the, the, the priority in a low supply environment, then, then we are gonna see the commercial ROI become even more stressed. So Jason, we've, uh, we've spoken around um, technology and policy and how those two together are sort of reshaping supply chains, both at the consumer level, then obviously also at, at, at the, at the um, supply chain operator level. One of the themes that I've been really struck by here in the last week of South By is the, uh, is the S and the G out of ESG, and then um, the focus on DEI, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, um, spoken to by all sessions, all companies. How is that reshaping? company's purpose and how they need to reshape their thinking to be part of the communities and be, uh, be responsible towards the communities they operate in. The imperative really comes much like with some of the battery tech, the, the real push is coming at the grassroots level that there are um, a, a real desire to see companies behave in a way that uh, investors are proud of. And this means doing many different things right. And you know, that means being good corporate citizen, right? Uh, being cognizant of what the, the environmental impact of what you do is, being cognizant of the social impact, uh, being cognizant of being inclusive of the people who are your customers and your vendors and the people who who live in our communities and making sure that all of that, you know, that that's what we want done right. And that's what, what companies are, are trying to do. And just like with the retail interest, right, this is, this is grassroots, but there's also big money behind this. Institutional investors want to see this happen. And so when you get that pairing of the grassroots interest in doing something uh, and doing something right, whether we're talking about trying to focus on sustainability uh, from an environmental standpoint, or trying to focus on a diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, doing something right when you have that, that retail social push at the individual level, and then you also have the big money push on the institutional side, things get done. And you also have thing, the things that throughout the system then um, you know, can support these. Because if you have retail consumers and institutionals pushing for it, uh, then you have things like rating agencies evaluating. You have audits uh, evaluating things, right? You can't improve something if you don't measure it. So now you have an entire culture around measuring better 
What is our CO2 footprint? What are we doing that's sustainable? And one thing we haven't talked about was recycling, which for batteries will be especially important because of the limited amount of things, right? How, how, what are we doing in terms of our CO2 footprint, in terms of our recycling, in terms of our efficiency of operations? How are we doing that? And then thinking about audits around that and, and thinking also around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like, what are we doing around that? Measuring that and then trying to work from there. And I think that's... The environmental and the sustainability piece is a little bit further ahead than diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of measuring things and, 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 and setting goals and moving forward. But companies are trying to move very quickly on this because it is um, not just a, a social priority and not just a, an individual interest. It's something that also we're finding at the institutional level, there is a mandate to do the right thing regarding um, all of this, right? Sustainability, diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And then uh, one of the, uh, so if you think about it from the sort of business uh, side of things, you know, how can you design products if you're not having representation on, on your board? Well, there's some of that. And I think there's also more importantly, perhaps, how can you use a product or consume product if you don't feel like that company is not doing what, what you view as the right thing and is not uh, being a good citizen as if, you know, we've sort of anthropomorphized companies in this way, but we want to see that their um, corporate behavior in different ways is right. And for some companies, it might be numbers of board seats or who's on different seats and who has different roles. But there are many other ways uh, that these things are right. Like I think about pay gaps. I think about recruiting. I think about um, being involved in communities. I think about nonprofit activities that are often fostered at the corporate level. So there are many different ways that companies can be involved and um, do the right thing when it comes to sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think sustainability, for example, the way European companies look at it, the way European companies think about CO2 or, or even the verbiage. Uh, in uh, Europe, it tends to be more focused on the verbiage around climate change. In the US, it tends to be focused more on sustainability. But um, whatever the imperative, however the verbiage is, is packaged, the idea is the same. Uh, we must do better in these different ways that we act as, as individuals and as companies. Yeah. Jason, thanks. It's been a fascinating talk. I just want to round this out by asking you, um, you know, if you're a, a CEO today uh, of a company embedded in supply chains, what are the three things that you would be kind of uh, losing sleep about, planning for, and uh, as you look over sort of a longer term horizon, you mentioned uh, moving from just in case, uh, just in time to just in case. Um, what else should companies be thinking about and planning for? I think right now my top priority would be concern about Cold War II and the risk of what would happen if we would see um, countries applying third-party sanctions in the wake of the, the Russian war on Ukraine. If we were to see third-party sanctions applied to, say, China, the economic risk around that is exceptionally high. So I'd be looking at kind of big stuff like that and, and knowing also that Cold War II didn't really start here, um, that there are other things that have been building up to this. So I think that's probably the first thing. The second thing right now that's really critical is the war, on, the, the, the war for talent. That right now you're seeing companies are fighting for highly skilled people. Demographics in every country in the world have slowing birth rates. Because of COVID, birth rates have slowed even faster than people were forecasting. There's a COVID baby bust. And so with aging populations and slowing birth rates, how do we have enough people to get everything done we want? How do we get the productivity? How do we fit automation into a super tight labor market um, in order to make sure businesses can meet their goals, can achieve what they want to? Because labor market's super tight and it might get even tighter, right? People talk about the, the gray wave became a gray tsunami uh, during the COVID period. Well, as we look forward, um, making sure that automation helps to augment and supplement the people in your company as a way to scale, just like every other kind of technology uh, has helped, right? Everything from software that requires most people, I know I don't have an executive assistant, I don't need one, right? Like I have email and I have PowerPoint and I, you know, I can do most of my own things. And for many people, that, that was a big scaling factor. Looking forward to both hardware and software that allow scaling 
is going to be really important. And then as the third piece, I would probably recommend thinking about just in case inventories as a buffer against risk and as a kind of insurance. It's a cost of doing business, but it keeps you in business. And so that, that's it. Cold War II, global conflict stuff, uh, automation fitting in and, and really trying to win the war on talent with an augmented workforce and planning for more technology as a lever. And then thinking about also having a little bit more inventory of everything around just in case, because the, the world supply chains are not going to get a lot looser over time. Jason, thank you so much for your breadth of insight here, but then also bringing it down to something very practical that uh, we and our customers and companies can, can really sort of uh, take action on. Thank you for your time. It's been a thank great, you, Graham. Great My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Thank you.